The following is a broadcast of North Burlington Baptist Church. We are going to reach a milestone in our study of the Book of Romans. Uh, some of you may or may not know, we started studying the Book of Romans back in April of 2008. And we've generally been taking on a couple of chapters every year as we have sauntered our way through. At times we have moseyed, but mostly we've sauntered. And, uh, and uh, we um, are looking at Romans because it's uh, what Martin Luther said, it's the chief book of the New Testament. It's a very influential book uh, for all kinds of reasons. Not that any of them are less important than others, but it, Romans is a major book within the New Testament. And so at the beginning of January of this year, we started Romans chapter 7. And if you remember when we did the Romans chapter 7, we said it's really not good to stay stuck at the end of Romans chapter 7 too long uh, because it really is a, a, a discouraging note unless you move on to chapter 8. And so we began Romans chapter 8 in February, uh, on February 12th. And today we are concluding our study of Romans chapter 8. And um, not only do the verses that we're looking at today, the last nine verses of Romans chapter 8, conclude the 8th chapter, they actually conclude a whole uh, argument that Paul has been putting out since chapter 5. So this is a major uh, demarcation in the book of Romans. And in fact, not only is it concluding from Romans chapter 5 to Romans chapter 8, it's, it's actually concluding a major section from starting at verse uh, chapter 1 all the way to where we are now. Because when Paul writes all of his letters, generally he writes them in two parts. The first part would be a theological section, uh, developing spiritual theological themes. Often there's complex arguments, as we've noticed, uh, that are involved in, in setting forth these theological truths. And in the second half, he goes to apply that theological grounding to the details of life. And it's more of a practical outworking of the theology he's developed in the first half. And you'll find this in, in all the letters that Paul writes. He'll start with theology, and then he'll move on to practical applications. And so uh, at the beginning of chapter 9, he's going to move now into the practical applications. Oftentimes, this is where he'll address the concerns of the people who have written him that he's responding to. They'll write, Paul, what about this? And before he even gets to their concerns, he'll lay out the theological groundwork before creating the answers to their questions that they've asked. And so uh, we are at that point today. And really, it's a good practice for all of us who are seeking to, to be followers of Jesus, that all the outworkings of our life, the practical ways in which we live, should be grounded and based upon a firm theological foundation. And so it should be our goal always to try and think as God would think, think theologically, and, and, and live out our life based upon what the Bible teaches. Just as a, as a plant uh, would grow uh, healthy if the soil that it's in is rich and fertile, uh, so we grow when we place our spiritual life firmly in the rich soil of God's Word. Because how you think, um, and what you grow up in as far as teaching shapes who you are as people. Imagine a young girl who during her formative years of growing up lives under the teaching of a father who says you're worthless and you're no good. The kind of person she would become as she grows will be much different than a young girl who grows up believing that she is the daughter of the king of the universe who took on human form to rescue her from sin because he found her of incredible worth and value. That person who grows up under that teaching is going to be much different from the person who grows up thinking she's worthless and useless. And that's true of us. When we live our life, we are always be grounding how we live in light of Scripture. And when we find how we live doesn't conform, that's where we need to go back and allow the truth of God's Word to Wait, to, to get deeper in our hearts uh, in order to influence how we live out our lives. And, uh, and that's why Paul, I think, starts with the theology in order to ground the life in the truths of, of God's Word. Um, and so these last nine verses of Romans are a summary of all that Paul has been doing since chapter 1. And uh, uh, in next week, or next week, next chapter, he moves on to the practical implications um, and I got to tell you, this is some grand conclusion. Uh, this is probably one of my most favorite uh, passages of Scripture in all of Scripture. Um, 
it's just, it's just fantastic. And actually, there's a great, I, I never realized until I was getting ready to preach this morning, I'm, I'm a little bit afraid, not, um, I won't do it justice. My, my fear is that you'll walk away going, oh. <laughs> and if you walk away just going, oh, then I didn't communicate what this is trying to say. It's absolutely phenomenal. So I want to read for you the text, and then we'll, as usual, go back and look at it phrase by phrase and try and understand it. Um, what then shall we say in a response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then can condemn? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long, for we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is phenomenal. If you... If you can get this here and live out of this, friends, your life will never be the same. Paul begins by asking a series of rhetorical questions. And I, follow along as I, uh, as I work through our way through the text. Uh, and he starts with the first question, what shall we say in response to these things? What things? What things is he asking us to respond to? Well, he's asking us to respond to all the things that he has been teaching about up to this point in time. All the things that he's taught about in Romans chapter 8. What shall we say to the fact that our present sufferings one day will be exchanged for glory? And that glory is so certain, it's spoken of as if it's already happened. And that one day we will be just like Jesus is in full manifest glory. What shall we say of that absolute certainty to that hope? What shall we say about that hope? What shall we say about the fact that the Spirit of God has remained, and He not simply to be with us, but to live in us, inside our bodies, not only to give us a taste of this future glory that He's promised, but also that He might intercede and pray through our prayers to the Father so that He can fully express the depths of our heart and the great desires that are inside of us in a way that perfectly conforms with the will of the Father so that our prayers have more power and more authority than we can possibly understand this side of heaven. What shall we say to that power? What shall we say to the fact that God is working in all the varied and disturbing, chaotic events of our life, that all the circumstances, no matter how awful, are being driven towards a sure and certain purpose, and that nothing is able to come that will steer you away from God's plan and his pleasure for you? What shall we say to that certainty? What shall we say to the fact that we have been adopted as the true children of God, and that because we have been honored with this, this position of prestige, we are first in line for an inheritance from God himself. And, and that because of our being adopted, we are now free from fears. And, and we are being held and given security and stability regardless of the storms that happen outside of us. What shall we say to that kind of security? What shall we say to the fact that the weakening and wasting away of our present bodies that the wearing down and the growing gold is just evidence that these earthly forms are not good enough to house the glory of our souls. What shall we say to the fact that Paul, Peter says that these present bodies are just like tents and one day they will be stripped away and we will be given mansions in their place? What shall we say to that kind of luxury that awaits us? 
What shall we say to the pronouncement of God that there is now, nor will there ever be, any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? That we've been set free from the taskmaster of having to obey religious rules and regulations. That we no longer have to be driven by codes and, and laws by which we have to conform our lives. But we've been set free so that our minds are now aligned with the Spirit of God so that we can know His good pleasure and will and we don't have to consult a list when we make moves. And that God has given us freedom that allows us to walk in obedience because he's working from the inside to conform us and no longer do we have to conform ourselves to outside rules. What shall we say to that kind of freedom? What shall we say in response to these things? That's what Paul is asking. But, but not only those things in chapter 8 that we've looked at, also all the things he's spoken of from chapter 5 to chapter 7. For instance, what shall we say to the peace of Christ that has secured for us uh, with God uh, a relationship that's no longer made us objects of his anger and wrath and, and punishment, but now we are objects of his affection and his kindness because our, rec- our relationship has been reconciled by Jesus. So there's no longer hostility between us. What shall we say to that kind of peace? What shall we say to the fact that when Jesus patched things up in this relationship with God, it wasn't simply so that we could know about God, but that we could know him personally. That we can draw near in friendship. Unlike any other intimacy we could ever know. What shall we say to such friendship? What shall we say to the fact that it's not just that we have been separated from God's anger, but now we are the direct recipients of God's kindness and his pleasure and his love and his blessings? What shall we say to such kindness? Friends, what shall we say to the verdict of innocence and the removal of guilt? The rest we can experience from striving. We don't have to try to please God. We're already found pleasurable. No more striving. What about the cutting way of hypocrisy? So so that we no longer have to put on a show in front of others and pretend we're something we're not. That we can walk just as we are without, without a mask, just being authentically ourselves, with complete integrity, knowing that we are accepted by God and there's no embarrassment or pretense What shall we say to the fact that when we fall, it's not final? (laughs) That when we we slip in our weakness, it doesn't jeopardize a thing in our standing before God? What shall we say to the fact that we were awakened for our need for God when we were asleep in darkness and he woke us up so that we might cry to him and when we cried to him, he rescued us? What shall we say to that? What shall we say to the security found in knowing that whenever we call to him, he will come to us because he is never far from us and his eye is upon us and we are the objects of his affection? What shall we say to the fact that he gave us the opportunity to partner in our own rescue so that we could take his power and work it out in our lives What shall we say to that kind of dignity that he bestowed upon us so that we can exercise his power to become more holy? Friends, these are the things that Paul asks us to respond to. How shall we respond to these things? These things he's spoken of from chapter 5 that we've already looked at in previous weeks all the way up to the end of chapter 8. And Paul takes all the wonder and all the splendor of all these things, and he summarizes in one pearl of a phrase. He says, all this is evidence of this one thing. God is for us. God is for us. And, and all this, all this glory is in light of what he said in verse, chapters 1 to 4, in which he painted the darkness and the guilt and the condemnation that was owing to us because of our sin and our rebellion against God. The light of this glory sets in the background of this darkness that we don't have time to review at this point. All this to say, God is for us. Friends, what shall we say in light of this? That's what he's asking. He 
He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? See, the point is this. Having paid so much, having paid the ultimate price of giving his son on the cross to secure our relationship, to secure the, the, the cost that was needed to pay for a relationship with us, whether or not we take it, but I hope you do, friends. Having secured that, will he not now also purchase everything else that comes with the package? It, it's, it's, like, it's like, imagine someone who is filthy rich and he buys you a luxury home. He buys you a luxury home and it's fully furbished. When he hands you the key, are you going to be going, oh, I wonder if I'm going to get dining room curtains? I mean, would he who paid so much for a fully furbished home scrimp on dining room curtains? In fact, the fact that you have the house with the key should guarantee that all the lesser things are coming, and that's what he's saying. He's paid the ultimate price. Why won't he give you all these lesser things that he's addressed? They're absolutely certain. Because God is for you. So who's going to bring any charge against those that God has chosen? What could anybody possibly say to condemn us? I mean, even if they drum up some charge that they feel would disqualify us from the blessings of God, who are they going to bring that charge to? (laughs) Because no one can execute it. It is God who's justifying us. Who then can condemn us? No one, he says. There's no one left who can condemn us. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. See, having died for us, is it even conceivable then that he would now try and condemn us? (laughs) I mean, and the proof that we have been, uh, um, that he was sufficient to save us is the fact that he's been raised from the dead. His resurrection is evidence that what Christ did for us is sufficient to fully forgive and to save us. It's the proof of our acquittal before God. And you can be sure that God's not going to forget about it because right at his right hand side is Jesus interceding for us. He's always talking to the Father for us. Forgive him. Help him. Be with him. Care for them. Nurture them. Strengthen them. Support them. But the Father is for us, and Jesus is there interceding for his friends. There's there's no way out of this. We are objects of God's love and blessing. See, the only one who is able to condemn us is the one who's pleading for us on the Father's right-hand side. There's no one left. Remember, Remember when Jesus with the woman and all the accusers came to throw rocks, and then he begins to write, and he says, those without sin cast for a stone, they all leave. And he says, who's left to condemn? The only one left to condemn was Jesus. But he was for her. And that's you, and that's me. He is for us. There's no condemnation, friends. Can you imagine if we lived out of that spiritual reality that we understood there was no longer condemnation? If we could, if we could believe with all our hearts that God is for us, and we live life that way. And Paul is wanting us to be absolutely convinced of this. Before he moves on to all the practical outward, he wants us to be convinced that there is no power, no authority, no thing that can actually interfere with you, that can stop you from being in the direct line of God's love. I think I forgot a slide. And so... um, he talks about, he, he says, there's, there's no trouble or hardship that can separate you from God's love. In other words, there's no life circumstance. There's no trouble. There's no scheming plans of other people, no hardships. There's, 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 there's nothing that can come in the natural order, whether it be uh, 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 something like a famine. There's nothing that can come as far as uh, any fearful events um, or, or things that might embarrass you, like, like shame, like, like nakedness. There, there's nothing like uh, fearful events, like, like danger that may creep up on you. There, there, there's uh, no anger and physical abuse 
by those who may even be threatening to take a sword and kill us. There is nothing, there is no power that can separate you from this love that's from God. You see, there's nothing new about persecution, he says. Even the psalmist talked about how uh, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered like sheep to be slaughtered. And those things, those hardships can't separate us from being objects of God's love. See, the outward appearances of externals do not touch upon the in, in, internal securities that are found and guaranteed in heavenly places for those who are in Christ. In fact, Paul says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. <clears throat> the word that Paul uses here, literally, it means, it means we're super conquerors. We're, um, we're over conquerors. He, he takes the, the, the verb that means... Um, to triumph or to conquer, to prevail, uh, to, to be victorious. And, and he, he intensifies it by putting the preposition hyper on it. We are, we are hyper victorious. <laughs> we are hyper conquerors. We are hyper triumphant. It's as if Paul is reaching for some word that's going to describe, uh, that will come close to the enormity of the certainty of the victory that we have because he loves us. And nothing can separate us from him. And just to make absolutely certain that we understand what Paul means when he says nothing can separate us, he lists those things that sometimes people assume will separate us from God's love. Or maybe to wonder about. He says, well, death and life can't separate us from God's love. See, death, which many think and many others live as if for the final separation, isn't the final separation. It isn't strong enough. Death is not strong enough to separate us from God's love. Neither is life with all its dis distresses and distractions and worries and cares. Life is not able to separate us from being objects of God's love. Some of you are caught up in life right now. And you're thinking it's too much. You don't know that God is stronger than those circumstances. Life will not separate you from God's love. Neither angels nor demons, not those speculative um, fascination we have with uh, spiritual beings who minister to us or the, the fearful trepidation of those fallen ones who would seek to destroy us. See, be they good or be they evil, uh, there is no spiritual power that is able now to separate us from God's love. Paul continues saying, neither the present nor the future. See, not the things you know about nor the things you don't yet know about. None of that can put a wedge between you and God's love. Not your history, nor your destiny. Not things from your past, nor anything from your future. Nothing will disconnect you from being objects of God's love and affection towards you. Are you getting his point? In case you're not, he says, well, he says, uh, not any powers I mean, not any, I don't know what else there could be, but if you think of any other powers, that can't separate you either. There is no force or influence. Nothing, nothing can separate you from God's love. Neither height nor depth. See, not only the invisible spiritual forces, but also those things which occupy space, whether they occupy the greatest heights or the deepest depths, it can't separate you from God's love, nor anything else in all of creation. You know, the Greek allows for this phrase uh, to be translated any other creation. And the word other literally means of another that's completely different. Some people have speculated that what this is saying, if there's any other alien life forces, any other kind of creation out there, it can't separate you from God's love. I don't necessarily agree with that uh, interpretation, but it allows for that. I think it just simply means that anything in all the created order, whether the physical order or the spiritual order, nothing can separate you from God's love. <laughs> Friends, here is a summary, okay? God has done everything for you because he is for you and nothing. And by nothing, I mean nothing. And by nothing, I mean absolutely nothing can separate you from being objects of God's affection and love. In an article uh, called Walk With Me, uh, a, a 
today's Christian woman's blog, not that I read those very often. Uh, Nancy Kennedy tells the following story. I'm sitting in yet another hospital waiting room. Ever since my husband Barry first underwent open heart and quadruple bypass surgery 15 months ago, I've been in this waiting room, or one just like it, more times than I can count on one hand, waiting for him to come out of the operating room. In little more than a year's time, my vocabulary has increased to include words and phrases such as aneurysms, atrib fib, and EP study with ablation. They all mean I have, put, I have to put on a cheery face, kiss get very goodbye, and promise I won't worry about him or forget to eat lunch and lock the garage door at night while he's in the hospital again. With all Barry's surgeries and procedures, we've had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad year. One of the worst in our 32 years together. Yet, ironically, it's also turned out to be one of the best. I learned just how deeply Barry loves me. As he was all prepped and waiting to go into surgery to repair his aortic aneurysm, Barry looked at my friend Tara, who was waiting with us, and said, make sure Nancy takes care of herself. Promise me, or else I'll worry. He wasn't worried about being sliced open again. He was worried about me. I came to faith in Christ three years after Barry and I married. And for almost 30 years, I prayed about my husband's relationship with the Lord. Then one day of Barry's uh, open heart surgery, he told me if he died... I'd see him again because he knew Jesus as his Savior. He prayed with me. He prayed with a friend. He prayed with a surgeon. Barry hasn't stopped praying. He prays with me every day. What I'd asked God for all these years, to hear the spiritual rift in my marriage, to bring my husband and me close, God has given. He'd performed heart surgery on us both ripping us apart, and then knitting us back together. Barry and I talk often about this past year, how it's been awful and awfully good. We wouldn't wish this kind of year on anyone, and we wouldn't want to go through it again. But we're glad it happened. We thank God for the good days and for the bad, because in all our days, God's held us both securely in his grip. We've known God's incredible kindness to us. Our hearts are in his hands. We've had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad year. And I praise God for it. You see, friends, nothing can separate you from God's love because he is for us. So, friends, what shall we say in response to this incredible love of a God who is for us and from which nothing can separate? I hope you get this. If you learn nothing else, if you learn nothing else in your spiritual life but one, this one lesson, you will be one of the richest people walking planet Earth. If you can walk out this truth in your life that God is for you and nothing can separate you from his love, and you can walk with confidence in that, friends, you will never be the same person. Let's pray. Oh, Donna. What's to worry about? What's to worry about? If God is for us, every circumstance in life has been shifted through his hand, which is good. If we're walking with him, he is with us in the midst of it. He won't abandon us or leave us. What's to worry about? That's the theological truth upon which we can live out our life that says do not worry. Yeah, absolutely. Why is worry so incredibly prevalent? Um, I think it has to do in part with our culture. When I was in uh, Rwanda, where they weren't guaranteed a meal every day, they didn't worry about their meals. 
we in North America who are, have, for the most part, guaranteed incomes, and if we didn't have income, we could get food at any of a dozen and a half food banks, and have friends who would be glad to pay for us, we worry. Isn't that strange? I think it has to do with our culture that has put such a high priority on having to take care of yourself, whereas if you can't take care of yourself and you're dependent on God, it is really cutting at our pride. And I think the issue is not worry, it's pride that says, I won't trust God if I can't trust myself. And he wants to strip that from us, I think. Let's pray. Father, uh, what shall we say in response to this? How shall we live now knowing that we are the objects of your love and that you are for us? Lord, help us, help us to live in such a way that people who see our lives will be attracted, not to us, but to you, longing to know the kind of security and the safety and the hope and the peace and the confidence and the integrity and, and the, the security that's found in knowing you, Lord. Help us to live those kind of lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I have the keys in the office. And not only that, thanks to Pierre at Ford, uh, we've got brand new. And because of Dave at Pioneer, we got five years of free gasoline for everybody here. And not only that, I personally have kicked in, and you're each going to get a Twinkie in the glove box. You don't believe me, do you? See, if you did, you would certainly live differently going out of this place. <laughs> See, but what if, what if the door opened, in walked Oprah, and she said, I've been following Merv's blog, and I'm so impressed. I'm giving everybody a free car. Then you may be tempted to believe a little further. And if you got the key in your hand, even though you couldn't go to the dealership for a couple of days until it opened, you would certainly live different over those couple of days because you got the key in hand and it came from Oprah. What if there was a God who gave you something so precious that unlocks something more precious than a new car and it's guaranteed with his blood? How would you then live in light of that, friends? Wouldn't you live differently? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't it cause people to say, what are you on? I mean, why are you always so smiling? Don't you see the things? Yeah, but you don't know how good they are on the inside because, friends, we have a whole world that focuses all of our attention outward to what you can get and what you can be based on what you have. And God says there's a whole world that exists and it starts from the inside. And I have given you riches that one day bleed out <laughs> into incredible luxury and value that this world cannot even compare to. How will you live in light of that? We'll find out, because now we go out into the world in light of the fact that God has done all these incredible things for us. Don't allow your mind to focus on lesser things. Put your eyes fixed on him who has done greater things for you because he is for you. And he continues to do great things every day. Open your eyes to the wonders and riches of God. God has poured out to the objects of his affection and love. Go in the grace and peace and the power and the blessings of God. This podcast is a service of North Burlington Baptist Church. If you have any questions or comments, you can email us at info at nbbc.ca. You can also find more information about us at www.nbbc.ca.